that you're pregnant? Is it the two pink lines, faint yet visible on the test stick? Or maybe it's one of those newer tests, the kind that spell it out directly. The word pregnant filling up the tiny window. Does a doctor confirm it through a blood test, detecting the earliest of signs that something has changed within you? How do you know that you're pregnant? Is it the moment you miss your period? Or is it when you throw up every morning for a week? Does the exhaustion tip you off? Or is it the sudden realization that you can smell everything, literally everything, in the house? When does it become real? Do you know it at the bathroom counter, stick in your hand? Or is it when the cold gel hits your stomach and a technician points you toward the image on a screen? There's a technology of pregnancy these days. Home tests and phone apps and all sorts of medical advances. Technology that not only tells you that you're pregnant, but also about the development of the fetus, the health of the baby. There's technology, I've been told, that can tell you when you need to rest and when you need to push. But Mary and Elizabeth, they had none of it. There was no peeing on a stick. There was no blurry image on a screen. It was just them and their bodies and an angel. Mary hears directly from this angel, Gabriel. He appears to her and says those words many of us know, do not be afraid, Mary. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And Gabriel also gives Mary the news of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for, who, for her who was said to be barren. Mary gets this miraculous news directly. But Elizabeth, Elizabeth has no interaction with Gabriel, at least not that we're told about. Gabriel visits her husband, the priest, Zachariah. Gabriel tells Zachariah what is going to happen. And Zachariah, understandably, though unfortunately for him, is incredulous and is therefore forbidden to say a word until these things have come to pass. So how did Elizabeth know? How did Elizabeth know she was pregnant? Well, presumably, Zachariah found some way to communicate something that Gabriel had said. And presumably there were some signs that she was pregnant. Elizabeth, we're told, is six months along by the time Mary comes to visit. So she's reaching the end of her second trimester. It's likely that her belly has grown. She might even be dealing with wonderful things, wonderful signs of pregnancy like heartburn and dizziness and backaches. But consider Elizabeth's situation. Take a moment and empathize with what she must have felt way back then. Elizabeth and Zechariah struggled with infertility for decades. 
decades. Scholars estimate her age at this point to be between 60 and 90 years old. It's far past the childbearing period. They thought they would never hear a cry like that. <laughs> they thought they would never have children. So yes, yes, a pregnancy was prophesied, and yes, her stomach is growing, but I imagine that she worried. People knew then, as they know now, that pregnancy is not the only thing that can cause a stomach to swell. It could be any number of other medical conditions. And we don't know Elizabeth's full history. It's possible that she's had a miscarriage in the past. After all, about 20% of modern pregnancies end in miscarriage, although we rarely, rarely talk about it. It was likely higher during Elizabeth's time. Maybe this is part of why she decides to seclude herself. She goes away on her own, somewhere where she can rest and pray and wait and wonder. Until Mary arrives and the baby kicks. It's possible to see this moment in the text as the quickening, the first perception of the baby's movement. It's a significant moment for contemporary parents to feel the child moving within, but back then, back then it was the first reliable sign of pregnancy. So when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt within her womb. Mary arrives carrying the savior of the world in her body, and Elizabeth feels the confirmation of a miracle. I've always heard this story referred to as the visitation. This beautiful visit between Mary and Elizabeth, between Jesus and John in the womb. It's one of my favorite stories of the season. Yet to consider this interpretation, to consider this moment as not only a visit, but as a quickening, it's profound. Listen to the words again with this in mind. The text says that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me for as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped with joy. Practically, the quickening tells Elizabeth that, that yes, yes, indeed, she is with child. Emotionally, the quickening relieves Elizabeth's anxiety about the viability of her pregnancy. And theologically, theologically, the presence of Jesus brings life into motion. John leaps for joy in the womb, a mighty kick of life, however impossible and improbable it may have seemed. Advent is a pregnant season. It's a season of waiting and watching and preparing. Advent is the knowledge that something new is on its way. And this pregnant season is filled with hope and excitement, but also with a little bit of anxiety. Because the truth is that pregnancy is precarious and it involves risk. At the very least, the risk of change, pretty major change. Advent is a pregnant season. And, I believe, 
that our church is in a pregnant season. I perceive a quickening here. Signs of new life in our midst. We're in the middle of internal and external restoration. We've faced the precariousness of our times and chosen to move forward with new ideas, the ministry model, a feasibility study for a capital campaign, some changes to worship, a new framework for our space share relationships. We're in a pregnant time. Do you perceive it? Do you feel the quickening of new life in our community? It's exciting. It's holy, and it's anxious. Perhaps this morning we can relate to the women of our text as we too wonder, what will it be like? What's gonna come next? As we too wonder what is gestating, as we too wonder what the labor might be like, what it might require of us. Advent, it's a pregnant season, but we don't often talk about it that way. We don't often talk about the realities of pregnancy itself. Just this past week at XYZ Group, we were talking about that silent night hymn and how it probably wasn't actually a very silent night. It's such a missed opportunity because these texts, when you dig into that, they're so layered with meaning. I see the parallels here for our communal life, but I know there are also parallels for us as individuals. For our personal lives, many can resonate with Elizabeth, can resonate with the stigma of infertility, or the stigma of not having children, Many can resonate with a desire for a child to love. And many of us are familiar with the precarity of birthing something new, of wanting something so desperately and seeing it come into formation. We're familiar with that precious, precarious, tender hope. We know what it is to be anxious even when we're following and trusting God's will. So how do we find peace in the midst of this? It is, after all, the Sunday of peace. How do we find the peace that allows us to navigate the change, navigate the anxiety? How do we find the peace that will allow us to perceive the new life within, because that's part of it too, right? To have a peace that allows us to be in touch with what God is doing. So I come to the words of Psalm 139, another fleshy, pregnant text that's fitting for this season of incarnation. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. How many have turned to this psalm? In times when comfort or peace is needed, it's an intimate prayer to God. God, you search me. You form me. You know me. And the psalm stretches the whole of life from birth to death to after. The last verse of today's section says, I come to the end. That could be one interpretation is I come to the end of, of the list of your works, of your qualities, but it could also mean I come to the end, to the end of this life here. 
I come to the end, I am still with you. I am still with you, says God. I am with you in the beginning and the end. I am with you in barren seasons and pregnant seasons. I am with you in the laboring, the pushing. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. It's an echo throughout every moment, every strand of our lives. The God in this psalm, the God whom we gather to worship on a Sunday is not absent, is never absent. This is a God who knows your most inward parts, the parts you don't let anyone else see. This is a God who knows your deepest wounds, your deepest dreams, your deepest mistakes, your deepest fears. And this is a God who sees it all and says, you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a God who comes to live with us in the most surprising and radical way. So in this world that is complicated and challenging and violent and traumatic. Let this bring you peace. You are known by God. You are loved by God. You are held by God in all things. And let this peace lead you to trust. At the end of our gospel text, Elizabeth says, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. I think Elizabeth worried. I do. I think she wondered. But I also think that she believed. She believed strongly and greatly that God was with her. God will fulfill God's promises, although it might not look the way that we expect. After all, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, was an infant born of a teenager, quickening the world by his very presence. My friends, God will fulfill God's promises. The promise of incarnation, the promise of grace, the promise of peace, the promise of resurrection. And one way that we remember these promises is through communion. A chance for us to taste and see that the Lord is very good. So let's come now to the table.